Hello and welcome to my masterclass. My name is Associate Professor Michael Cowling and I work in the School of Engineering and Technology at Central Queensland University in Australia. Today I'm going to talk to you about pedagogy before technology and extended reality in the classroom and give you an idea of what extended reality is and how it can be used in practice. And then I'm also going to talk to you about how you can use technology effectively in your own practice in the classroom and give you some strategies for how you might do that. So the first question you might ask is, why would we use this technology? Why are we gonna bother with technology at all? And I must admit, I get asked that question often. And the argument, of course, is because our students are gonna have to live with technology in society. And sometimes you get some strange interactions with technology. Sometimes you get school principals or teachers saying, well, I'm gonna ban mobile phones from my classroom. And that seems to be at odds with the way that technology is going these days. Because technology these days is such a big part of what we do every day, that the idea that you would ban a mobile phone from your classroom just seems the antithesis of the 21st century and what we mean when we talk about the 21st century. And so I think rather than banning technology, rather than saying we shouldn't have technology in our classroom, what we should be doing instead is we should be saying, how can we use technology effectively in our classroom? Yes, they might end up using Facebook or Twitter or getting a little bit distracted from their task, but really that's no different than if a student looks out the window or stares up at the ceiling. And so what we need to do is we need to engage the students and then they'll use this technology for useful purposes. They'll use the technology in order to look up words, in order to understand more about a particular concept that you've been describing. And this is supported by the literature. If you look in the literature in various different places, for example, the World Economic Forum, they argue that technology is a really important thing for us to uh, embrace in our future. They argue that the skills that we build using technology with decision making and problem solving and computational thinking are all massively important skills that we need people in the 21st century to have. And I would argue that if we don't have technology in our classroom, then it's very difficult for us to build these skills in our students. And indeed, if you look at a report from Gartner in 2018, they talked about the emerging technology hype cycle. And they talked about this idea that sometimes we build expectations for technology that are a little bit unreasonable. And I love this particular graph because it talks about the curve of inflated expectations. And that is true for a lot of technology. And then we fall into the trough of disillusionment because technology is not doing everything we expect it to. But Gartner argued that eventually we will reach our slope of enlightenment and eventually we will reach the place where we recognize that technology is important part of what we do and that technology should be an important part of our classroom practice. In fact, if you look at the Gartner graph, you will see that some of the technologies I'm going to talk to you about today appear on this graph as things that are either starting or moving through our trough of disillusionment as a mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality. These kinds of technologies had inflated expectations, but maybe are now at a point where we can start to really think about how this technology might actually be used effectively in our classroom practice. And then if you look at the NMC Horizon report again, this one is from 2018. In higher education, the report suggested that the time to adopt things in the next couple of years is coming for things like mixed reality and robotics and artificial intelligence. And so they're also arguing, like Gartner, that in the next couple of years, these types of technology will be an important part of classroom practice. And as a practitioner, I can tell you that virtual reality and augmented reality as technologies in the classroom can make for an awesome classroom experience. But I do argue that we do need to strike a balance. We do need to make sure that we have courses that put us back in control of our technology. And whenever I talk to people about this, they'll often say, well, what about kids using their mobile phones too much on Snapchat or Instagram or social media? And that is indeed a problem. It is important that we have courses that put you back in control of technology and that we teach these kids 
about being digital citizens and digital well-being. What do we actually mean when we talk about extended reality? What do you mean when you say VR? What do you mean when you say augmented reality or mixed reality or augmented virtuality? And so I found over the years that the best way to describe it is to use a continuum called the virtuality continuum described by a fellow called Milgram with somebody else called Cushino, almost 30 years ago now, in 1994. And the Milgram virtuality continuum suggested that the way that we think about technology and how technology fits into our world should talk about how we mix together the physical and the digital aspects of technology into the thing that we're actually trying to deliver. And so on the very left-hand side of the Milgram virtuality continuum, we have real reality, and that is entirely physical. It's what we're sitting in right now. It's when we're not wearing the VR or the AR headset or using our mobile phone or interacting with something in the world uh, using a digital device. It is real reality. And then on the right-hand side of the continuum, we have virtual reality. And virtual reality is entirely digital. So when you put on the VR headset, you disappear from the real world. I've had students tell me anecdotes about being scared by somebody walking up behind them, tapping them on the shoulder, and then freaking out because they didn't know that person was there because they were in some entirely different virtual world. And then in the middle, of the virtuality continuum, we have that combination of physical and digital that we've been talking about. And so on the left-hand side, next door to real reality, we have augmented reality. And augmented reality is predominantly physical with just a little bit of digital mixed in. And what's really important about AR is that we have to have context. We have to have the AR fitting into the physical environment, otherwise it's not particularly good AR. And so good examples of AR are if you were to look at a wall. As you look at that wall using an augmented reality device, you could strip back the plaster and you could see the electrical wiring underneath or the plumbing underneath. That's a good AR experience because it's contextualized to our environment. So it's mainly physical with just a little bit of digital. Smack dab in the middle of the virtuality continuum, we have mixed reality. Mixed reality is 50% physical and 50% digital. And so it can often be an augmented reality experience, but it's also often used to describe an experience where you look at an object. And as you look at that object, that object is augmented with something digital in order for us to interact with those physical objects. So as opposed to AR, which is often the environment, mixed reality often involves a particular object. And so you might think about a plumber doing a plumbing task, wearing a mixed reality headset. And as he's doing that plumbing task, he gets augmented reality digital annotations that let him know to tighten or loosen a particular pipe or uh, you know, unscrew this screw here, or I don't know a lot about plumbing. So that's probably about as much as I can give you. But that gives you an idea of what uh, mixed reality is all about. Next door to that, so almost at virtual reality, but not quite, we have augmented virtuality. And augmented virtuality, of the terms in the Milgram virtuality continuum, this is certainly the one that is used the least often. Uh, but in actual fact, a lot of the experiences that we get that are virtual reality experiences are actually augmented virtuality experiences. When you think about a lot of the VR headsets you've seen these days, you might have seen that they often have a set of controllers that you hold. And you can see a digital version of those controllers in your virtual environment. And so they're really an augmented virtuality experience. We can even take that a step further and we can have the kids sitting on a roller coaster uh, and we can have them riding the roller coaster and as the roller coaster goes up and down, the seat moves backwards and forwards and left and right. And we have a situation where they're getting the physical sensation of being on the roller coaster but in an entirely virtual world. And so that's my crash course on mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, augmented virtuality, and also good old fashioned real reality as well.
Okay, so let me give you some examples of how you might use mixed reality and augmented reality and, and what these different headsets actually do. So this first headset is called the Oculus Go. And the Oculus Go has what's called three degrees of freedom. And so when you wear the Oculus Go, you don't have the ability to move backwards and forwards in the room or left and right in the room. You usually use the Oculus from a seated position. And when you put on the Oculus, you are totally immersed in the world of the Oculus. So you might be immersed swimming with sharks or exploring the International Space Station. You don't often use the controller as you're using the Oculus Go. It has very little physical, you are entirely immersed in a digital world. And because of that, we call this VR. It belongs on the right-hand side of our virtuality continuum. This one here is the second example. This is called the Microsoft HoloLens. When you wear this headset, you can still see the real world. You can still see the world around you and you can interact with the world around you by placing what Microsoft calls holograms within the world. Microsoft has marketed the HoloLens as mixed reality for a number of years, but based on the virtuality continuum, you might argue that it is a little bit more towards augmented reality than it is towards mixed reality because there is more physical mixed in the real world than there is digital. Here's the third example for you. This is the Merge Cube. And the Merge Cube allows you to look at digital objects through a mobile phone, through an iPad. For example, you hold up the iPad, you hold up the Merge Cube. And by looking at the Merge Cube, you can see a digital object. So for example, a model of a heart. And as you rotate the cube, you can look at different parts of the model. And you can also use the cube in various different ways to animate the model. So you might see the heart beating, for example. The Merge Cube is 50% physical and 50% digital. The physical environment is important so that we can see the cube and we can rotate the cube and we can see what it's doing. But the augmented reality, the mixed reality, the digital environment is important as well. So the Merge Cube represents an example of a 50-50 mixed reality intervention in the extended reality virtuality continuum. Finally, this one here is called the Oculus Quest 2. The Oculus Quest 2 is a six degrees of freedom headset. So unlike the Oculus Go, you can wear the Oculus Quest and you can define where you want to walk around in the room and interact within a physical space using the headset. You've also got two controllers and you can use the controllers in the games or the various experiences. And so you can pick things up using the controller, you can press buttons using the controller. And in some games and some experiences, those controllers are replaced. They become fishing rods or some other implement that you're going to use in that particular simulation. And so the Oculus Quest is a great example of augmented virtuality but don't let yourself be bound by the continuum because ultimately it's all extended reality and extended reality as we've highlighted can be really, really valuable for the curriculum and for your pedagogy if you can use it effectively. Hopefully now you understand a little bit about how the virtuality continuum works, but the reality is that Technology is only as good as the use you put it to. And so it's worthwhile spending a little bit of time talking about how technology might be used to improve pedagogy, to improve our classroom experience. And I do a lot of this work with a professor at Bond University called James Burt, who runs a lab which is called the Mixed Reality Research Lab. And so we do a design-based research process to actually make sure that the work that we're doing is effective, that it is actually making a difference for the students. And this is really important because because there is a lot of novelty in tech. There are a lot of people that will stand on stage and tell you that some new piece of technology is the next big thing. And so what we want to do in our lab is make sure that that technology is actually effective in practice. And so let me give you a couple of examples of how we do that. And the first example is some work that James does at Bond University, predominantly with the architecture and the construction management students. And this is about something that he calls comparative pedagogy. And comparative pedagogy is recognizing the fact that once you use extended reality in the classroom, you can start to think about how the different modes of extended reality might give you different views on the same thing so that you can understand it 
more effectively. And so James does this with architecture students and with construction management students by giving them a virtual reality, an augmented reality, and a real reality view of an architecture project. And by doing that, he gives them the opportunity to interact with the project, with the building, if they're architects, in different ways. And so, for example, with virtual reality, you have the opportunity to go to places in the building that you can't go to in the real world. You can go inside the foundations and you can see how the foundations work. You can see the stress level on the foundations and you can see how those foundations are able to hold up that particular building. With augmented reality, you can walk through the actual building and you can have that building augmented with things like light levels or wind currents or where the electricity is or where the plumbing is. And then of course, James also walks people through the real reality as well. They can see the actual physical building and how it works. They can see the 2D plans. And then importantly, they can compare what they see in the virtual, the augmented and the real reality views of that building to understand how that uh, building works and to understand the characteristics of it that are important if you're learning to be an architect or a construction management student. James and I also did work in anatomy and physiology because once you start talking about going inside things, then it makes sense that the next thing you might do is go inside the human body and see what's happening inside the aortas or the ventricles and how the blood actually flows. So when you ask the students to identify the left aorta, how many times do they rotate the heart before they actually find that? and maybe that'll help you as a teacher to teach them more effectively about the heart in the future. So we use this a lot for anatomy and physiology. We also use this technology for simulating packet flow for computer networking. So for computer science students, they often have trouble understanding how a computer network works because they have a mental model of that computer network. It's based on a, a model called the TCP IP model. It's a five layer model, but they don't have the opportunity to see how that model works in practice because you can't overlay the TCP IP model over the top of the actual physical switches and routers and computers and things that make up a computer network. And so what we did is we used augmented reality in this case to give them the physical markers that represent the switches and the routers and the computers, and then augment over the top with the TCP IP model so that they can see that when traffic travels between two computers in the same network, for example, it travels along the data link layer. But when it travels between computers on different networks, well, then it goes up to the internet layer and to the transport layer of the TCP IP model. And we can animate and we can model that with colors and with shapes and with lighting effects so that they can understand how the model maps to the actual physical experience. And then finally, the last product is the paramedics product. And this is the project that we'd been working on the longest. And this all started because the paramedics at my university, CQ University, were being taught at a distance. But paramedics, as you can imagine, is a fairly physical skill. And so to teach the paramedics, we needed a mechanism to make sure that those paramedics could practice those skills as well as the time that they got to spend at the university, which was only about a week. And so we developed a 3D printed set of forceps and a 3D printed scope. And we used an augmented reality experience for the students that they could download on their own mobile phone so that they could practice laryngoscopy with foreign object removal at home before they came to the residential school. And as I said to you earlier, one of the most exciting things about the paramedics project for us is that we ran several trials and we were able to identify that those students that used the mixed reality tools were more effective than the students that had just viewed the videos and read the documentation about paramedic skills. In other words, we were able to make these students better paramedics by using these tools. And so now 
how are you going to achieve this in your actual classroom? And not surprisingly, when you think about applying this technology in the classroom, my advice is to not think about the tools, but instead think about the pedagogy behind it. And I've already talked to you a little bit about the research that we do in the Mixed Reality Research Lab. And that research is based on a research paradigm called design-based research. And design-based research asks you to identify the problem, come up with a potential solution to that problem, test that solution, and then importantly, take on that feedback about how you tested it and what worked and what didn't, and apply that to a reiteration of that particular problem. And then on top of the design-based research model, there is another model that I use called the pedagogy before technology model. The first step says, what is your problem? The second step says, how can I solve that problem? And then the third and final step says, how can technology help? So assuming that you're on board with the idea of technology, hopefully you'll come up with a problem. But I would caution you at this point to not think about the technology, to don't think about mixed reality or augmented reality or virtual reality, but instead just say, how would I solve this problem if I had a magic wand and I could do anything not constrained by time, not constrained by money and come up with that solution and then get on the internet or find an educational technologist or go back to the beginning of this masterclass and think about how technology can help. And so we're doing a project, for example, in physics right now. The physicist said to us, well, one of the problems is that the students can't see the particles and how they repel and how they attract each other. And she said, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we could literally hold those particles in our hand and we could bring our hands together and we could have those particles attract or repel? And that would be an awesome intervention, but I don't know how to do it. And we said, well, we can help you with that why don't we do this in virtual reality? And so the technology is the third step in the pedagogy before technology framework. It comes after the problem. It comes after the solution, but it's an important part of what we actually do. And so let me give you an example. Uh, with the paramedics project, we started the PBT framework work by saying, what are your problems? And then they said the biggest skill that they have trouble with is laryngoscopy with foreign object removal because this is not a skill that you practice often, even as a practicing paramedic. And so because of that, they need a way for students to practice the skill more frequently. And we said, do you have evidence of this? And they said, yes, indeed we do. And showed us where students had said things like, the course uh, is a skills learning course. There should be a way for us to actually get more time doing the skills. And so we said to the paramedics, well, this sounds like a problem. How would you solve this problem? And they said, well, the best way to solve this problem would be to send all of the students a paramedic dummy and a scope and a set of forceps that they can have at home so they can practice the skills. But we don't have the ability to do that. The dummies cost $10,000 each, and we can't send one to every one of our students across Queensland, across Australia. And so the solution was a dummy. And that solution was free of the technology limitations, but by working with myself and with James from the Mixed Reality Research Lab, we were able to come up with a solution that actually made sense in terms of a time and money approach. And so as I said to you earlier, we 3D printed a scope and a set of forceps, and we took those as well as a cheap headset that was worth a few dollars that we could send to the students and not worry if we got it back, it's along with a link to an app put the device in the headset, and then practice laryngoscopy with foreign object removal themselves before they came to the residential school. So we had solved the problem based on the PBT framework, but now what we need to do is we need to evaluate because there's no value if we don't make some sort of evaluation. So applying the design-based research methodology, what we did is we went back and we had a look at the feedback from the students. And I'll be honest with you, the reason we did this is because in our initial test, there was not a statistically significant difference between the students that had done the virtual reality and the students that had done the standard classic textbook. So we went back and we looked at the reflections and we found various different things. One of the things that students said quite often was that looking at the scope and looking at the forceps meant that they were distracted from doing the actual skill. They weren't actually able to practice on the dummy because they were distracted by the physical forceps and the physical scope in their hands. So what they wanted is they wanted more digital 
and less physical. And so we move the project along the virtuality continuum to augmented virtuality. And you still saw the scope and forceps in the view, but as soon as the phone recognized them, it turned off the camera, it turned off the real world, and you were in a totally virtual world where you were still manipulating the virtual objects using the physical tools in your hands. And the students found this much easier because that now no longer they were able to see the physical tools, their own hands, and be distracted by them, and they could focus entirely on the simulation. And so we collected some data again, and we identified that the second time around, there was a statistically significant difference. That means that the students that used the augmented reality, mixed reality, extended reality tools were more effective paramedics when they came to the residential school. And we then looked at how we might roll these tools out to practicing paramedics so they could use them to practice because this job can literally save lives. And as I've worked with teachers, this technology platform, the PBT framework, the use of extended reality has been used in a variety of different contexts because as soon as the teachers understand the technology, then they can start to apply it to the curriculum. So for example, you might think about using augmented reality to teach students about humanities and social sciences concepts by getting them to do an augmented reality scavenger hunt, where they go out and they look up in trees and they identify objects that are digital objects in the trees that will help them to understand Australian flora or Australian fauna. Maybe you teach kids about geography by giving them an opportunity to fly a virtual reality drone. So they wear the headset but fly fly the physical drone and explore the cliffs or explore the landscape using that particular object. Maybe you teach them about maths by using robots to get them to understand angles and distances and various other things. But the important thing always is that you start by thinking about the problem that you're having, think about ways to solve that problem, and then finally think about how the technology can help. And so to finish us off, here are some examples of technology that you might use in your own practice and how those technologies might actually work in your classroom. So you can have cheap things, you can have mobile phones, you can have Google Cardboards, or if you'd like, you can use more expensive devices like the Oculus Go or the Oculus Quest or even more expensive devices like the Microsoft HoloLens, depending on what the problem is that you're actually trying to solve. And if you're looking to teach this in your classroom, there's heaps of technology that you can teach as well. Things like Unity 3D are often used to develop virtual reality interventions, as is the Unreal Engine. But there are also other technologies that teachers use, like CoSpaces VR, for example, that are ready-built solutions that teachers can use to interact with content and to provide a virtual reality experience. And something that I've been promoting recently as a low-hanging fruit is 360 degree video because using a 360 degree camera, you have the opportunity to film an interaction, to film something that's going on and then very easily put it in an immersive virtual reality view. You won't get the interaction that you would get from augmented reality or even augmented virtuality, but you will get the opportunity to immerse somebody entirely in some other situation. And so that gets us to the end of our masterclass. And so hopefully through this, you've understood how virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, augmented virtuality can be used effectively in your classroom. You understand what they are, why we should bother with them, how we can use them in a classroom environment, and then importantly, how we can evaluate this content to make sure that it's doing what we want it to do. And I would encourage you, as you use this content, to share with me your experiences and let me know what you're doing and to connect with technology people that you know to understand how this technology works. But if you do come up with an awesome experience that uses the PBT framework, please connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn or via email and I'd be more than happy to hear about how that works. 
But for now, I'll say just once again, if you want to know more about these technologies, then please visit our websites at the Create Lab, at the Mixed Reality Research Lab on my own website, which is michaelacowling.com. And you can find out a little bit more about what we're doing in this space and the things that we're implementing. And as I said, it would be really interesting to hear from you if you implement these. So that's the end of my masterclass. Thanks for watching. Thank you.